Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are going to take a look at the Mauser model of 1912 and 1912-14 automatic pistols. These are, well, they're quite scarce. There were no more than about 200 of these guns made in total. And I think they're, they're a really cool example of something that Mauser was trying to do starting in about 1907. And that is to create this whole, like, a, a continuous family of pistols that all had the same basic shape and the same basic design, uh, but would scale in cartridge from 25 automatic, or 6.35mm at the bottom, up to 9mm at the top. And the idea was we have one basic style of pistol, and you've got army versions, and holster versions, and pocket versions, and you know everything you could need. Um, in some ways this is kind of analogous to like what Colt did with a 31 and a 36 and a 44 caliber revolver. Same sort of idea. So um, the first of these guns that was tried was actually the model of 1909, which was a straight blowback 9mm semi-auto, and it proved fairly quickly unsuccessful. The problem was the 9mm cartridge was just too strong for the system. So uh, Mauser kind of did a quick pivot, and they, they switched over to the small version, and they went to the 1910 pattern in 6.35mm. Now we'll talk about those guns in a different video. Uh, but suffice to say that became quite popular and very successful. 25 automatic in a blowback worked just fine. So as the 1910 started to develop sales and you know the, the engineering process kind of they, they finished up, the R&D guys went back to working on 9mm, and they wanted to come up with some way that they could get a 9mm version of the same basic style of pistol to work. And so uh, they, that brings us to the model of 1912. Now, at the very beginning, they tried a couple of a couple of different options for delaying the blowback system. Um, the first one was a vertically traveling, a vertically pivoting wedge. Actually, I had two different versions of vertically pivoting wedge, and they just didn't work very well. Finally, however, by 1912, or by probably 1913 at this point, they had come up with a mechanism that would work, and that was basically taking the flapper locking system from the 0608 pistol, uh, and converting it from flapper locking to flapper delayed blowback. Um, another an analogous system here, kind of like we have roller delayed and roller locked. Well, we had flapper locked in the 0608, and later the Mauser Flieger carbines, and then we have flapper delayed in the model of 1912 pistols. So uh, we have a couple different iterations of these, from some very early ones up through some very late ones. So let's take a look at how this pistol changed over its development process. All right, we're going to talk about some of the very early production guns that have a few little changes. But first I want to actually take apart one of these and show you how the thing actually works, because it's a really unusual mechanism. So this is serial number 51. They're numbered both on the back of the gun and on the spine of the magazine. It has a single line roll mark for Waffenfabrik Mauser in Oberndorf, Mauser's patent. And if you're familiar with this family of pistols, you'll recognize a lot of things. Things like the safety here. So the safety, uh, you pull this lever down and that engages the safety. And then to release the safety, you push the button and now the gun will fire. Uh, kind of an unusual system. In fact, the place that you might also recognize this from is the CZ-27, which as an aside is actually the final iteration of this family of Mauser pistols. But again, we'll talk about how it got into Czechoslovakia in a separate video. For now, let's stick to the 1912s. So our magazine release is a heel release. It's easy to think that this button would be the mag release, but it's not. The magazine is just a single stack. It is numbered right there on the back of the spine. Um, and again, looks very much like just an upscaled version of the 25 and 32 caliber uh, Mauser 1910, 1914, 1934 pistols. This has a bit of an interesting mechanical feature in that when it is empty, it will lock open, and you can then take the magazine out. However, there is no slide release, and the slide stays locked open until you put a new magazine back in the gun. And presumably loaded, but even with an unloaded magazine, when I click that into place, the slide will automatically drop, and if it is a loaded mag, chamber a cartridge, and the gun is then ready to fire. Now, uh, I didn't show you the trick. You can't just pull the slide back. You can't 
but it takes a ton of force because of the delaying mechanism that was built into the gun. So they had to add basically a cheater lever. So you've got this little lever underneath the barrel. When I pull that down, it's going to disengage the, the flapper delay mechanism and allow me to very easily pull the slide back. So no lever, no movement, push that lever in, slide opens nicely. So let's take this apart and see how those flappers actually work. In order to do that, I'm going to lock the barrel open. This is very similar to the other pistols in this family. I'm then going to rotate the guide rod, pull the guide rod out. I can then take the barrel out. This just lifts out of the gun. Now I need to take the slide off, so I'm going to hold it in place, pull the magazine out, push the magazine back in to release the slide, and pull the mag out so that it doesn't catch. And then this just comes off the front of the frame. So there's our slide and our recoil spring, and I'm going to leave the striker in place. I'm not going to take that down. So here is our flapper delay mechanism. And I've got this lever on the bottom. When I pull the lever back, these two flaps are going to pull outward. So what this lever is actually doing is pushing that middle piece forward, which is going to force these two levers to cam open. Now they're under spring tension, so I can pull them open by hand out here. But notice that they have a little bit of an angle cut at the front. Then if we look at the slide, you can see that the front of the slide has this big steel lug that's going to drop in there uh, when the gun is assembled. And it is the front of this square lug that is going to push against these angled surfaces. And if you push hard enough, that will force the flaps apart like that, which then allows the slide to cycle backward. So that is the delaying mechanism. It actually has fundamentally a lot in common with the roller delayed system that would come some 40 years later. 30 years later, I suppose. Uh, 35 years later. It would come later. So uh, this is the final system that Mauser came up with, which did actually work. However, uh, it works based on some very careful engineering of these uh, interface angles and, and precise design uh, of all of these parts. So not a cheap pistol to make. And you'll notice that each of these little parts is serialized because once you get the gun fitted together and properly tuned, it's important to keep all those pieces together. We'll take a brief look at the back of the gun here, but basically just to show you that it is a striker fired pistol. You can see the sear right there. When I pull the trigger, that front part of the sear is going to drop down, which releases this striker. That striker travels inside this channel in the slide, so the tip will come out here and fire a cartridge. All right, so that flapper delay mechanism would remain unchanged throughout all of the 1912 and 1912 14 pistols. Um, and by the way, the, the, the Mauser Pistolen book by Weaver, Speed, and Schmidt refers to these guns as a 1912 second model because they have the flapper delay mechanism, uh, with the original 1912 being basically the, uh, the other, uh, the vertically tipping locking blocks, the, the experimental guns. Uh, some of the collector community refers to those as 1912s and these guns as 12-14s. According to Mauser Pistolen, the 12-14 is only the version with the tangent sight, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, so you may see the nomenclature differ, uh, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, unfortunately, none of these guns have a model designation written on them, and so that's where some of this uh, disagreement comes from. At any rate. While the flapper locking system or flapper delay system would remain standard, the early guns would go through a little bit of variation before they kind of standardized on a production version. So what I have here is number 29, number 35, and number 51. And by 51 we have the standard final production version. But there are a couple changes that we see in these two. So first off you'll notice that there's an extra uh, plane. There's, there's some extra detail here on the front of the frame on both of these two, where by 51 it's just smoothed out. Um, they were able to change the frame enough that they didn't need to have the extra machining step to have a, you know, two different steps uh, in the frame of the gun. And that's on both sides, by the way. You can also see a change in the slide serrations. So on the very early guns they just put serrations on the slide, 
Uh, but then fairly quickly they decided that that didn't give you enough purchase on the slide. So they changed the design to have two actual extended lobes coming out of the side of the slide with uh, closer serrations on them. And that actually works really well. Um, that, that gives you a really good grip on the gun. Uh, maybe the most significant of the changes is to the markings themselves. So our very first gun has a hand engraved three line address mark, Pfaffenfabrik Mauser, Oberndorf AN, that's Om Neckar, and Mauser's patent. By number 35, that has changed to a two line address mark, but it's still hand engraved. And then by 51, they have standardized on a single line marking that is now being done with a roll stamp. So that's when you know they're, they're serious about production, is when they've got the roll stamp done so that all the pistols can be very quickly and uniformly marked. A couple other minor changes to point out. Uh, you can see the trigger return spring back here um, on the very first gun, or our very first gun, number 29. Uh, just by 35 they have extended the trigger back a little bit uh, so that it doesn't, you don't have the opening between the trigger and the frame. And then we can also see some variation in the flap release lever. So this is our very earliest gun, 29. It's a little bit larger of a lever, and it's like fully checkered. Um, by 35 the lever has gotten smaller but it's still got the cross hatching, and then by 51 when they're standardized you've got the smaller lever and just a couple of horizontal serrations on it. There are a few other even yet smaller changes, just little things like the grips. So the grips are all handmade on uh, number 29 here, the, the checkering on the grips goes all the way to the bottom, uh, the other two it doesn't. Um, and a little bit of a change in pattern of the safety lever. So, I mean, it's, it's getting really subtle at this point, but effectively what we have here are, uh, you know, handmade individual pistols and they're iterating features until they get the final version that they want to actually put into production. Including a change in serial number font. So the early guns have these little tiny serial numbers, on the later production ones by the time they standardize they go to a larger font, and that allows me to segue into the later production guns. So about the time they get to serial number 100 they start offering a shoulder stock, or a holster, a combination holster stock, because this is the same pattern of holster as the C96. Uh, this becomes an option. Of course this requires having a slot uh, in the back strap of the gun to lock that slot, that holster into. Holster stocks were kind of uh, in vogue at the time, and Mauser was no stranger to them, so what we have is a, a metal slot. Uh, with the grips cut out to fit around it. Now this wasn't done on all of the guns over 100, uh, it simply became an option at that point, um, and there are only a handful of stocked guns that are known. So this particular one is number 135. The stock is serial numbered to match uh, here on the, like the top of the wrist. There's our locking mechanism, little sliding lug. It is also numbered on the butt plate or uh, the trap door. Again this mechanism is basically identical to the C96, although the stock itself is a little bit smaller than a C96 stock. It's only as big as it has to be to, uh, to properly hold one of the pistols. Now what's interesting is despite there being something like 10 or 20 stocked pistols made in total, uh, there are actually reproduction stocks that were made. So all of the original production stocks are this dark walnut. All of the reproductions are a much lighter colored walnut, and you might wonder like who on earth would make reproductions of something this rare? Like what do you do with it if you can't find a, a, you know, a slotted 1912-14 pistol, what are you going to do with the stock? Well the answer is the reproductions were made by Hank Visser, who was a, a notable, very noted uh, Dutch collector who had an ownership stake in Mauser, and in the 1960s he did in fact get his hands on a pistol like this with a stock cut but no stock. And he wanted to have a stock, and so he found one that he could borrow, he took it to Mauser, who originally made them in the first place, and Mauser made a run of 20 reproduction, beautiful, like perfect reproduction stocks for him. But um, as far as I know, they're all a much lighter shade of wood. So on the off chance that you are the sort of person with an interest in uh, very esoteric stocked handguns, and you're looking for one of these 
be aware of that. Um, those reproduction stocks were originally not numbered. Um, however, at least a, a few of them, I think, have become associated with slotted pistols whose original stocks have been lost. Numbers have been added. Just be aware that that's not really an original stock. Now the very last version that we have to take a look at here is one that was made uh, more specifically with the military contract in mind, and thus it has a tangent sight that is uh, calibrated out to 500 meters here at the back. So you can set that uh, for much longer ranges, as opposed to the standard fixed sight on all the regular versions of the gun. Uh, the earliest known one of these is serial number 141. This particular one is number 174. Um, again, there are only a very small number of these tangent sight models made right at the end of uh, production. So the idea was maybe the military will be interested. You know, they wanted that tangent sight on other guns. This again was something that was kind of in vogue at the time. So let's make it an option. On that topic, it is interesting to point out that none of these pistols are actually proofed. Um, these were all done as like experimental shop pistols or early versions, or, well, to be entirely honest, I don't know exactly the circumstances under which, you know, why none of them would be proofed. Um, a number of them did find their way into commercial trade. Of course, things like the stock slot, was those were offered as an option. There were people buying these guns, but production was small enough, and for whatever reason Mauser opted not to actually take these through the formal proof house. So unless they've done something like, say, get sold into commercial trade in England, where they're required to be proofed upon entry into the country, and will thus end up with British proof marks. Unless something like that has happened, uh, these Mauser 1912 or 1214s, none of them are proofed. In total, as I said, there were no more than 200 of these pistols manufactured. Uh, and a couple of things kind of came together all at the same time to end the development of these guns. Now they did actually work, but they were very expensive guns to make. And by the time the last iterations were being made with the tangent sights that might be, you know, might draw military interest for a military contract, well, now we're talking about it's the summer of 1914. Um, the first thing that happens is Mauser dies, uh, Paul Mauser dies in May of 1914. And he had been very heavily involved in the R&D side of the business. And so the whole research and development uh, side of Mauser took a really big hit when he passed away. And then, three months later, in August, World War I breaks out. And World War I is really what clobbered the development process once and for all for these pistols. Because the German army was now, now they're not looking for like, what hypothetically might be a good system that we can use and maybe we can replace the Luger. Uh, now they're looking for a lot of guns inexpensively. And this is not an inexpensive system. The Luger is not either. But this would have been, you know, finishing up development of this and replacing the Luger with it would have been a disastrous enterprise. That would have been, it would have really hurt the German war effort. So um, those two things together ended development of this. Now the, the family idea may have fallen through, um, but they would go on to continue working on the small versions of these pistols. There would be the model of 1914 um, in 32 ACP, and then there would be a follow-on model also in 32. Uh, in 1934. So Mauser kept working at the system, they just kind of stuck to the plain blowback and abandoned the ideas of the, the delayed blowback iterations of it. Uh, if you're interested in more information on these guns or some of the other stuff that Mauser was doing at this point, um, aside, well, including as well as beyond the, the more commonly recognized things like the C96, I would recommend Mauser Pistolen uh, by Schmidt, Speed, and Weaver. Um, it's the best reference out there, that's where the information in this video came from. So uh, you can check out a copy of that if you're interested, and thanks for watching.